can't somehow. This will stop. Oh, this won't stop? I think if you just hit the. No, this will stop, but I just want to make this. Oh, I see. Somehow it won't. Is this okay? Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Um, okay, so um, hate to be the bearer of bad news right at the at the kickstart, uh, but we have a fire marshal code for this room, so, which means that no people people should not be sitting in the aisles. So if you have a seat, you you have a seat, uh, and I, I see a few empty seats. Uh, yeah. There, this there. lecture will be uh, webcast immediately after the lecture. And you're not required to be in the lecture. It's a little secret. Um, so, yes? Is this considered an aisle? It's, it is a passage. So, so we'll, we'll have to ask all of you who are sitting in the aisles to leave, um, unfortunately. But, or find a seat if it's available anywhere in the middle. Uh, Please squeeze in. There's a couple of seats in the middle that are empty. Yeah, if if people who are sitting can like just move to to toward the middle where the seats are uh, um, not occupied, then we'll free up a few more seats. Is there a distinction between waitlisted and regular students? Hmm? Is there a distinction between waitlisted and regular students? We, we can, but yeah. Okay. We're really sorry. I'll be having office hours immediately after the lecture, so. Those of you who would like to come talk, meet me, say hello, please stop by office hours.
Look, I, 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 I had people two years ago in Poly do the same thing, and then, and then Fire Marshal came after us and you know, wanted to shut down the class. So. Well, it's 10 past, it's officially Berkeley time, so let's get started. Welcome to EE16A. How many people here is it their first semester at Cal? Give yourselves a hand. Actually, you might not know something, but this is my first semester at Cal as a professor, so I'm in the same boat. I'm really, really excited to be here to be teaching EE16A this semester, and I'm really looking forward to having a great time. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in a minute, but before we do that, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this course. So how many people recognize all of the pictures that are on the screen right now? Or most, some of them, at least one of them. How many people recognize at least one of them? So there's a self-driving car up there. What's down here is a CT scanner. There's an iPad. There's a drone. There is a Netflix DVD with a mega recommendation engine behind it. And there's a Fitbit. And what is interesting about all of these different technologies and devices is that they interact with information from the physical, real world and are able to process it and provide us with some utility. And in this class, we're going to be thinking about these kinds of devices, and we're going to be talking about them from an informational perspective. How do we design and understand these kinds of devices and technologies? The goal of this course is to build up your foundation for the rest of your career within EECS, not just at Berkeley while you're studying, but also as you go forward for you know, the next 40, 50, 60 years as you go ahead and be practicing engineers. So what is the lecture plan for today? It's the first lecture. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have some introductions. There'll be some administrative details that we'll have to figure out. We're sorry again about the room size. Unfortunately, just this is the largest room on campus and there is not a single room on campus that is larger to be able to accommodate everyone. But we really, really will like to have as many people in lecture as possible. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about discussions and homeworks. I know there's been a lot of questions on Piazza. We'll talk a little bit of give it, you an overview of how um, 16A was developed and what material is going to be covered in the class. And then we'll get right into it. We'll start with module one. So let me give you a little bit of an introduction about myself. My name is Giri Jaranade, and I just came here from being a researcher at Microsoft Research AI in Seattle. And there I was working on a variety of technologies around basically understanding stability and safety in control, and thinking about it using tools from probability, information theory, and machine learning. In addition, I was doing a bunch of data science-related projects and trying to understand, um, for example, the spread of misinformation in the context of um, uh, political content, as well as thinking about you know, different impacts of artificial intelligence and technology. There's, of course, the obvious impacts of how we can do better things and do more using AI. But there's a lot of considers, or considerations around how it impacts society. How do people who might not have a technical background actually interact with technology? How do we make sure algorithms are fair? How do we make sure they're transparent? 
And this is uh, something else that I've been working on while there. I'm now, uh, this is, as I said, this is my uh, first semester here. Before I started at Microsoft, I actually got my PhD here at Berkeley, working again in problems in control theory and information theory. And before that, I got my bachelor's degree at MIT. My co-instructor here will be Vladimir, and I'll let him introduce himself. Okay, welcome everyone to 16A. Uh, I love this course. Uh, it's my fourth semester teaching it, and I mean, you can tell by that. Um, I um, work in the area of hardware systems. I build uh, integrated circuits. They're pretty much in every device that you have right now, phones, uh, laptops, in data center, and things like that. So um, I'll be covering that part of the course. But in general, I'm really excited about this course. It brings out the best in both students and staff. So I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I do. Um, I graduated from uh, a school that shouldn't be taken against me, like South in the Bay. Um, and then spent some time at MIT, and then here I'm at Cal, and I love it. So um, yeah, I look forward to working with you and uh, really having you enjoy this course. I'll tell you a little bit more about kind of what we do here kind of in the middle of the lecture. So I said that this was my first semester uh, as a professor at Cal, but I wanted to say that this is not my first semester teaching 16A. Actually, I taught the first ever offering of 16A back in 2015. And 16A has been you know, developed with a lot of thought put into every single homework problem, every single discussion, every single lecture slide. There's been many, many people who have you know, put hours and hours of their time into trying to make this the best class it could ever be. This is not just people uh, who are shown here, but also many people uh, on the TA staff back then as well as right now. And with that, I wanted to introduce our amazing TA staff. First, I wanted to introduce uh, Grace and Rohan, who are our head TAs. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rohan, and I will be the student-facing head TA for this semester. Um, what that means is if you have any administrative questions or enrollment, homework, attendance questions, anything of that sort, please email me at uh, ee16a.staff at gmail.com. Please do not email the professors. They'll just forward uh, your email to me. Um, another announcement is that if you have any midterm or final conflicts, please email me and let us know. Within the first two weeks of class, we don't offer alternate exams, but if you let us know early, we can do our best to work something out. Thanks. Um, and hi everyone, I'm Grace, nice to meet you. Um, I will be the internal head TA, and what that means is I'll be interfacing more with the staff and organizing things behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, so we have some other TAs here. This is not everyone on staff, but they'd like to introduce themselves as well. Yeah, just quickly say your name, your, and what you're um, working on in 16. I'm Sam, hi, I'm the head homework TA, so get to deal with all your guys' homework. It's going to be a great semester, so get excited. Okay. I'm Elena, and I'll be doing discussions in mostly managing Piazza. Hi, I'm Varsha, and I'll be a discussions TA. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm doing discussions. Hi, I'm Linda. I'll be teaching two labs. Hi, I'm Eddie. I do discussions, and I also handle the website and software. Hi, I'm Lydia. I do discussions and handle some content. Hi everyone, I'm Sam, I'm the head lab team, so I'll be handling lab content and training internally. And just to mention, there's about 30 TAs total and uh, the student um, helpers are also are 70, so we're at about, a staff at about 100 people trying to help you. 
uh, we'll have extensive office hours and homework parties, and Grigia is going to cover all that logistics. But just know we're about a tenth of you. So we're really here to help you and uh, you know, be successful in this course. So as Vladimir said, there is many of you, there is many of us, and there is a clear path to becoming um, you know, a TA or an ASC, being on the 16A staff. All you need to do is you know, be great in 16A. We're always re looking to recruit people to join the staff next year. You can join as an ASC. You can get to help out with making homework, content, grading, helping in office hours. Um, then the next step is to become a GSI or a UGSI, and then soon, eventually, you will all become professors. <laughs> it's pretty linear. With that, I will get into some more of the logistics. I'll try and get through this fast so we can get through the fun stuff as much as possible. There is a website. It's also ee16a.com, I believe. Um, and all of the course material and information will be posted there. Piazza is the most important forum. We will be using it to send out announcements, homework, posting your questions, answering your questions. It will be an active forum. Please make sure you sign up. Um, quick note on policies. So the syllabus for the course will be on the course website. We expect each of you to read the syllabus and actually understand the policies for this course. Please keep in mind, this is a really large class. As you can see, there are a th over a 1,000 of you. And so it is really helpful to us if you can actually read and know the policies. All of these are designed carefully. You will not believe how many hours we spend trying to think about the best way we can help everyone learn. So there's a lot of thought put into these policies. Please follow them. The next important thing I wanted to say was that we will not be grading this course on a curve. No one in this room is competing with anyone else to get a grade. We will set absolute thresholds, and we will award grades accordingly. So theoretically, everyone in this class could get an A if everyone had the right level of performance. So please, help each other out. Be good citizens. Be kind to each other. Be kind to your TAs. The last policy that I wanted to talk about is a no-tech policy in class. So I'm going to ask everyone who has a laptop or a cell phone or a tablet open to please put it away immediately. We put a lot of work into making these lectures, and we would appreciate 100% of your focus. Yes, question. Um, notebook tablets for? Um, we prefer paper and pen, but if you want to use a notebook tablet to take notes, come talk to me in office hours, and we can see if we can make an exception. You learn best by writing things down. It's much better than just scrolling through the slides. This is uh, something that we've just observed over time. Um, come talk to me afterwards, and we can figure something out. OK. Yes, most of these slides will be put. Uh, all of the slides will be posted online. Uh, lectures will be webcast. You can go back and look at them. But I highly, highly encourage you to write things down in lecture. Take notes. It helps you learn. You will learn better by going back and looking at your own handwritten notes than looking at the slides. Other questions? OK, great. We are doing this because we want to make the best use of uh, classroom time as needed. We might give little tech breaks as necessary uh, in the class. If you end up falling asleep in lecture, that's totally fine. People get tired. It's OK to fall asleep. It's much better than reading your email or checking Facebook in the middle of class. <clears throat> this class is going to be organized and taught in a way 
uh, that it is, or, or this class is designed for a specific target audience. And this target audience is incoming freshmen and junior transfers people who are just starting at Cal. There will be a bunch of you who are also sophomores who for some reason or the other weren't able to take the course earlier. And great, you know, we're really, really happy to have all of you in 16A. We're really sorry that because of you know, the fact that this class is new and we had capacity constraints as you can see in this classroom, that there are people in this room who are juniors and seniors who were unfortunately not able to take this course earlier. That said, because you're juniors and seniors and you have a stack of experience of taking classes that the um, you know, people who are just coming to Cal do not have, please keep in mind that we will be targeting and teaching this class to be uh, in, a, in a freshman uh, and junior transfer-oriented way. This is the same style, for example, that uh, 61A uh, is taught. So we will not be assuming that you have any background in linear algebra or in physics. Okay. One thing I wanted to point out on this, people have been asking about discussions. What discussion do I go to? How do discussions work? What is this 999 discussion? This is the discussion schedule. It is posted on the website. You will see the name and time and room for every single discussion and the TA that is teaching it. What we're doing this year is we're going to try and have different discussions oriented towards different groups of students. So all of the discussions on this sheet that are in orange, if you're an incoming freshman, please try and attend one of the orange discussions. If you are a junior transfer or a senior transfer, please try and attend one of the discussions in green. If you are someone who has a strong background in linear algebra, has taken Math 54, and are in 16A, please attend the blue discussion. We're trying to do this so that our TAs can better orient the discussions to target you know, people with different experiences and different backgrounds. The white discussions are open to everyone. Anyone can attend them. In fact, all of the discussions are open to anyone and can attend them. Find a TA and a teaching style that works for you, and please attend that discussion. Please attend discussions regularly. This will really be, this will really be helpful. While any discussion is open to you, we please ask that you try to attend a discussion that is for your group of people. If you have any questions about this, please come and talk to me in office hours, and we can go from there. Any questions? Yeah. There's no signing up. You go to the discussion that you, uh, that you would like to. If the room is overflowing, we ask that people who are in the targeted group um, please attend those discussions. So if it's a freshman discussion and there's 25 seniors in the room, we please ask that you attend a different discussion. Um, unfortunately, not. This is all on the website. None of you need to take pictures of any of this content. Everything is on the website. Yeah. The content in all of the discussions will be exactly the same. You will not be falling behind or going ahead by attending any of the discussions. You are more than welcome to attend multiple discussions. The content will be largely the same. It's just that you know, since certain questions will arise for certain groups more than others, and people can learn in groups better together when their learning styles are similar, we're trying to uh, have people with similar learning styles and backgrounds together in a class. So are we supposed to attend one discussion on Monday and one on Wednesday? Yes. There is a discussion A and a discussion B, one on Monday, one on Wednesday. Yes, you can attend different discussions. There will be a discussion attendance policy, which we will discuss. Last question. Um, it's parallel. Everything is on the website. This is tiny font. I don't expect anyone to choose their discussion this exact minute. All of the information is on the website.
Let's hold questions for now until the end of class. Please come talk to me afterwards, just in the context, in the, uh, in the interest of getting through everything. OK, homework. Homework will be due every Friday at midnight, with the exception of homework zero, which has already been released. Homework zero will be due Monday. It is a baby homework. Basically, all we want to do is make sure that you can actually submit homeworks, and you can actually submit your grades to the system. Homework parties will be held every week starting next week. So there'll be a homework party from Wednesday 9 to 11 and a homework party from uh, Thursday 2 to 4. This is an opportunity for you to socialize and meet other people from the class and work on your homework together. Think of it as like a pickup game. You go together and you say like, hey, who's working on problem one? Hey, I'm stuck on part three of problem two. Let's discuss, let's collaborate. We encourage you to think about the homework on your own before going to homework party. There will be many, many office hours that you can also go to in case homework party does not work with your schedule. All of this is posted on the website. Every time, once this, um, when the homework is due, we will then release homework solutions. You are then required to look at the homework solutions and assign yourself a self-grade for every problem. All of the details on how to do this are posted, again, on the website. The idea is that we want to make sure that you are able to go back and look at the solutions and understand where things went wrong. So details about self-grades, again, are given on, uh, given on the website. Another new policy that we're introducing this semester is we're allowing you to resubmit your homework along with your self-grades. So what does this mean? Homework is due every Friday at midnight. Self-grades will be due the following Tuesday at midnight. In between this, we will actually release the solutions to the homework to you. We understand that you know sometimes something will happen, you have a midterm, you have a particularly long homework, the homework is particularly hard, you know, everyone has a personal life, stuff happens, and maybe you won't be able to get through every single problem on the homework. We are allowing you this year to submit your homework again at the Tuesday deadline after the solutions have been released. After you have a chance to look at the solutions, you can look through the solutions and solve the problem again for up to 60% makeup credit. So of course, it's better if you submit on the Friday, but you can get a large chunk of the credit by actually submitting your homework uh, later on Tuesday. We really, really encourage you to try the problems before submit by Friday. But in case something happens, in, on the off chance that you know things are, things are tough, you can actually make up a part of your grade by resubmitting the homework after going through the solutions. Details of this, again, are all on the course website. Please go ahead and read them. A quick pointer on you know, how to succeed in 16A. We really want you to just focus on understanding Problems and homeworks in this class will, might be different from what you've experienced previously in um, other classes that you've taken before coming to Cal. We really try to focus on understanding. We really, really encourage you to attend lecture, especially if you're a freshman or a junior transfer, if this is your first semester at Cal. Please, please attend lecture. Um, attend discussion. We will be posting notes for every single lecture. Read the notes actively. Actively means take a printout. Write stuff on the paper. Circle things you don't understand. Don't just like click through it on the PDF viewer. Um, attend homework party. Try the homework on your own. Help others on Piazza. Look at the questions people are asking. See if you can learn something. Study with others. Study alone. And you know, offer help. Seek help. And come to all of us. There's many, many of us. And we are here to help. Our goal is to make you succeed in 16. That is what we are here to do. There's no other reason anyone joins 16A staff other than to help you guys learn better. So our motto is basically that you are here to learn, and our staff is going to work really hard through all of these office hours, question answers, uh, homework parties, and labs. The one thing that we really, really don't want you to do is to cheat. Cheating is anti-learning. It is harming your, uh, it's, it's just harming you in every single way. You never want to be in a situation where you're a real world practicing an engineer and your ethics are being questioned. 
don't start with academic dishonesty. We will have to be very strict about these cases and they will be sent immediately to the Office of Student Conduct. So we expect you to behave and treat each other and the rest of the people in this course with respect. By cheating on the homework, you are disrespecting the rest of your colleagues and peers in this class and you're disrespecting the staff who is working so hard to give you the best learning experience. So that's basically everything I want to really say. Um, yeah, be kind and compassionate. I guess I already said that everyone here is really smart. Everyone comes from a different background. You can learn something from every single person in this class. I'll say take a minute right now and introduce, your person, introduce yourself to the person to your left or your right. Make a new friend. Plan to help each other out. <laughs> Make sure there's no one left in the middle who has no one to talk to. Okay. Great, now everyone has a friend in 16A. All of you already have one friend. Please talk to these people at homework party, at office hours, in your discussion. Work on your homework together. Life will be better. Finally, some people might have noticed that there was music playing at the beginning. We're gonna start an EE16A playlist. So if you have suggestions on a song that you would like to hear, at the beginning of class, I know it's a 9.30 a.m. lecture, you need to wake up, we're gonna do our best. Post to Piazza, we'll start a thread on um, 16A morning songs. Um, please make sure that they are songs that can be played in a classroom setting. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to having a little bit of fun together. I like the song that we played today. One last thing, because we really want you guys to get to know each other and to help each other out, this is a core part of becoming a great engineer, which is exactly what this class is trying to teach you. Learning to talk to each other, to communicate your ideas, and to be able to listen to other people's ideas. These are two distinct skills that are important to learn. And for this, what we are going to institute is a good citizen credit. What this allows you to do is it allows you to give points or tokens to other peers in your class. So let's say someone helps you in homework party on a homework problem. You can say, oh, thank you very much. I can award you a point. And these points can add up towards being extra credit. This is not required. This will be extra credit on top of all of the other uh, homework and midterms and so on and so forth. But if people are exceptionally helpful in homework party, in office hours, on Piazza, every student can award up to two points every week. You cannot keep awarding points to the same person. Um, the idea is to meet different people in the class. So um, again, details and rules for this are written on the website. Please go ahead and take it in the real spirit that it's meant to be. What we're trying to do is we're trying to communicate to you sincerely that being an engineer is not just about putting pen to paper and writing out equations. It's about communication, it's about listening, it's, be, it's about being a good citizen. Okay. We will also offer extra credit for you know, people who can create interesting content, demos, videos, songs, interesting explanations, new homework problems. The idea is, again, to start exercising your creative muscles and engage with the content in different ways that you can. Again, rules for this will be announced as we go on. This is all extra credit. What we're trying to say is like, this is not a game that you have to try and get through, but if you want to engage with the material in different ways, we're here to help, we're here to support you. We think it's cool. So now, we'll get started with the actual material. What is the 16AB series? As I said, our goal here is to try and teach you how to think like an engineer. What does this mean? We want you to be able to model, to design, and to build systems. And we want you to be able to do this from some like vague specification that says, hey, can you try and get a, you know, a device that does like take pictures and automatically post them to a website? You don't exactly know what the specifications are, 
but you have to try and map out the problem, build a simple model, and go on and actually implement all of the steps. We're trying to actually teach you how to do this design process as well as the modeling and thinking. So yes, we're going to be teaching you linear algebra. Yes, we're going to be teaching you signal processing. Yes, we'll talk about some machine learning. Yes, we'll talk about circuits. We'll talk about some design. But what we're trying to communicate to you is not the mechanics of Gaussian elimination. What we're trying to communicate is the way that you learn to think. Because this is something that will go with you regardless of what career path you take. Whether you end up deciding to be a software engineer, a hardware engineer, you go into research, whether you go into you know, science policy, whether you go into public service, whether you go into a health-related field, whether you move into the humanities, learning how to think like an engineer is such a valuable skill. So yes, there's mechanics, yes, there's homework problems, but the way of thinking is what we're really trying to communicate. And we really encourage questions that will help you grow uh, in that direction. So please try and take the spirit in which this class was designed. We're trying to provide basically a complementary perspective to 61A, which I think many of you will also be taking, and focusing on the mathematical and the hardware um, sides of the department. So when we think about 16, we think about it as connecting really to many, many different parts of the department. We want to give you a flavor of what it means to be an EECS major. And so you will get hints of many different courses. You will have a hint of you know, courses like CS70 with uh, probability in them. You will have a hint of optimization and machine learning and AI. You will have a hint of graphics. You will have a hint of robotics. You will get to see digital, some digital design. You will get to see some ideas from optics. You will get to see some ideas from circuits and design. The idea is to say, hey, this is great. It's your first year at Cal and you're going to be able to do whatever you want. Learn what the different options are. That is why this course is being designed, so that not only can you get a sense of what is going on, but you can be rigorous, and you can be deep, and you can have strong foundations. You should be able to walk out there with confidence that you know your stuff. That is the objective. The homeworks will be hard, and you'll have to work hard. But the payoff of being able to walk out to an interview and say, I really understand Gaussian elimination. I understand how we're thinking about subspaces. This will be tremendous. So the specific topics that we'll be talking about in the class will have three modules. The first will be a linear algebra focused module that will talk about imaging and tomography and will also talk about some cool applications to page rank. The second module will be focused on the touchscreen lab and uh, here we'll talk about linear circuits and design. And I forgot to say, in the first, um, first module, there'll be a parallel lab, which will be the imaging lab, which will, again, the lectures will tie closely with and will kind of center the spirit of the course. There's a reason that we have lectures and lab, because there's conceptual ideas and there's actually doing, this, doing the stuff in the physical world. And it's important to understand when a model fails and when the model works. That's why this class has these two different components. And finally, we'll have a locationing and least squares lab where we'll talk about some basic ideas from machine learning and optimization. We'll talk about how GPS works and talk about um, some cool applications of linear algebra. So with this, I will hand over to Vladimir for a little bit of a more detail on the perspective of 16A. Okay, um, so here are some very old devices, and maybe one of you can tell me uh, what is that device um, all the way up there with 1837. Okay, great, many of you told me, okay. Um, well, very popular device at a time. Uh, that was how people used to send information various distances uh, across the country. You know, first very small from one uh, city office to another, and then longer and longer, and then they got really bullish. and said, okay, maybe we just go put this giant cable in the sea, or actually uh, Atlantic Ocean, and try to send information between the two continents. Well, didn't quite work. And people started wondering why. Why does it work on land, on some shorter distances, when you start laying out this long cable in the sea, it doesn't work. So then, 
they went back to some fundamentals, looked at physics, looked at kind of what they're trying to, what kind of signal they're trying to create with this device, how does that propagate through the material, like the copper cable, and they actually figured out that the reason was that the cables were re really lossy. So when you try to send these little pulses, they actually lose their shape as you go across a long cable. So they're not really able to receive anything on the other side. And then they started devising kind of circuit measures or system measures to try to fight that. And of course, now you don't even think about that. In fact, such cables are optical and you send bits blazingly fast. But at the time, these kinds of steps of going back and understanding what's wrong with the situation, creating a model and then creating a solution for the problems that that model exposes is kind of the engineering practice that persists to this day. And you're just do using it in different contexts. 150 years ago, that this was the problem. And as you'll see, um, as our technology has progressed, who knows in 20 years what the problems that you'll be facing will be. But no one thing that this methodology that we're trying to teach you in this class of describing what you're trying to do, modeling it, then figuring out with that model how to implement it and then finally test it is kind of a practice that you'll be using on and on and on in your life. And the sooner you start doing it, the better you will be throughout. The actual mechanics, what kind of math, what kind of physics you're using are a, a fact of the time. The math and physics that they used here is different than what we use in today's transmission systems largely. Um, but it still served them, this mechanism actually served them to be able to design more complex systems. So we have systems like this today, of course. Um, they are useful for a lot of things, maybe not just for, for doing pictures, but we're gonna dive into kind of what is actually in these systems and what made us be able to progress so rapidly from telegraph, these electromechanical types of primitive systems to these very, very sophisticated systems. If you think about these uh, things that I'm showing here, like Gary just said at the beginning of the class, they're not just doing some computation. They're heavily interacting with the external environment. They're sensing something that's going on, then they're processing that, and then they're reacting to that in some form of actuation. They're producing some result that then affects you. Right? And there's many, many situations there. Um, these devices kind of interact with you by showing you back information on the screen or sending information somewhere else. Uh, here at Cal, we're building devices that are actually interacting back with your brain, like neural stimulators, helping people actually walk or uh, solve a disease and things like that. And all these systems have these commonalities. You sense, you process, and then you actuate. And the labs that we designed and the modules are also done in that way, that they give you a sense of various topics in which you will have to figure out how to design a part that does some sensing, like a camera or like a touch screen or like an audio GPS, do some processing based on that to understand how to use effectively that information and then act on it, do something with that information. Okay, all that is really enabled by this amazing progress that I'm showing you here. Um, uh, Gordon Moore is actually uh, a Cal alumni, which is kind of fun, almost six, 68 years ago, that's quite a time. Um, and he made in, actually before I was born, he made a prediction that every two years, people will be able to double the number of small electrical switches that they can put on a piece of silicon. Silicon is a very abundant material. Uh, you have it everywhere on Earth. And people started learning how to make little chips, little integrated circuits in which they can put a lot of these switches. A switch on gives you current, switch off no current, and that's actually binary information that you can use for digital processing, but also some analog circuits and things like that. Um, and he made a prediction that people will be able to scale, add more devices every two years. And what that gives you is this line over here, that in this many years, you'll be able to put actually billions of devices on a single chip. In fact, in your pockets, and backpacks, you probably have 
almost 100 billion worth of devices throughout various chips that you have. That's a lot of computational capacity, okay? So you have like supercomputers on you from the perspective of people for, who were using these devices before you were born, for example, right? And this is an amazing thing if you think about it. It kind of is scary to me to think 20 years from now, what actually are you going to be able to keep in your pocket? If this trend continues, it is slowing down a little bit, as I'll show you, for a very good reasons. Um, but, uh, oops, okay. We will find ways to get more computational power. This is kind of what people have been able to achieve so far, and it has been quite a ride, and I'm really uh, intrigued to see what you guys will be able to achieve in the next 20 years as, as you come out and start doing things. And so this is Mark Bohr, another Intel fellow. He's uh, one meter, 66 centimeters tall. And so he's roughly here. And if you look at, this is a cross section of a chip, an integrated circuit that, for example, runs a 11 or 12 iPhone uh, processor in your um, uh, pocket. And so here is a 10 nanometer. This is currently a 10 nanometer process node, means that that switch is 10 nanometers big, right? It's way past the fly, the mite, the blood cell, uh, the hair. It's, it's actually smaller than a virus, okay? And so really, we have a little bit left until we hit a silicon atom. So people are already starting to think about quantum computing and things like that, where you're actually computing subatomically, right, and using that information. And you will be the generation that carries these concepts forward. Okay, so just get to give you an idea where, uh, what, what the power is. Of course, we're resting on the shoulders of the giants. Here are just a few folks um, to, that have laid out foundations in across, across all, all of these fields. Uh, Ada Lovelace uh, wrote the first computer program, um, first female software engineer, um, which is really cool. Uh, Turing invented the Turing machine, how to build a computer. He also beat Germans in decrypting uh, Enigma, which is a really notorious coding machine that they used uh, during Second World War to send encrypt messages. Once you could decrypt the messages, you know what's going on. So he designed a machine to, to do that. Um, Claude Shannon looked at kind of the problems that I alluded to earlier in terms of the telegraph. How far and with what energy can I send a piece of information? And how fast I can do it across a certain medium? And he was able to actually figure out very cool um, theoretical bounds that are very simple to formulate that tell you, look, in this medium, this is how much you'll be able to do with this much energy. Before that, people were doing all sorts of very complicated speculations, but he was able to derive a very elegant theory and just as a side, uh, for his master's at MIT, he did kind of this whole derivation, how these little electric electrical switches form bigger circuits and things like that. So he is actually an example of a guy who's both heavy on math, but also understanding how to build practical systems with switches, uh, with circuits, and things like that. And showing you that you really, to be able to think holistically about systems, you need to understand both sides. Uh, I already mentioned this kind of process, but I really want to show it to you on this slide just so it sticks in your mind. If anything you should remember about 16A is this diagram here and that you will learn how to build these kinds of systems. That systems that sense and do some processing and then if you decide to stick with 16B, you'll see a little bit of the actuation side and design little cars that drive around and interact with the environment. Uh, so you'll have a, a complete feel of a full control system that does some sensing, some processing, and some actuation. And not only the theoretical level, but also building the actual hardware that does that. So once you understand these design challenges and how to overcome them, the hope is that whatever the technologies that you ta tackle in a year, five, 10, 20 years, applying the same design recipe and analysis and modeling will help you get through it. 
and show you're a Cal graduate. Okay? It's very important. I've actually recently learned that if you go to any company in Silicon Valley and there's a critical job that somebody's working on, and it's really important for the company. If you ask who, who that person graduated, where, where that person graduated from, they say Cal. Okay, this is not a joke, actually, it's a real thing. So that's what we're trying to teach you here, to really be able to dig into these problems, apply these methodologies on and on, and solve them. In many other schools, you'll see people doing analysis. I give you a problem, you solve it, right? Problem's there. Our homeworks, as Gurija mentioned, are totally different. We're try and actually exams. We try to give you a specification and have, we call these design problems. Try to give you a specification just like your manager will uh, or just like you'll dream up if you have a startup company and you want to do something. Um, I want to do blah, how do I do it? And then we'll give you the steps to solve it and then you'll come up with, the, with the thing that actually satisfies the specifications and the solution. You're not just gonna analyze, you're gonna synthesize, okay? It's a very hard thing to do, and it's something that people, unfortunately, start learning later in life when they finish school, but really is one of the critical skills to innovate, and that's why we wanna start it from your first class here at Cal. And then the whole sequence of courses that I'll show you later is actually starting with 16B, and then 105, and others, 70, is now designed to help you perpetuate that kind of thinking. Okay, so that's really what I want you to get out of 16A. If you get st stuck or frustrated on a design problem, that's okay, because people much older than you are also frustrated when they read someone's specification and they don't know what it means, right? But then we try to have you go at it several times and become better and better and finally a Jedi master of design, right? So there are these three kind of uh, sections where in imaging, you're gonna sense something that's on, the, uh, on, a, on an image. You're gonna use some physical mechanism transduction to move that information that's on the image into some quantity that you can actually use and manipulate. In this case, it's a photocurrent on a detector. That photocurrent, then my other circuits can detect. And I can actually build, you'll be breadboarding circuitry that actually does that. And then you're gonna put it, be able to put it into a computer. Because computer can detect voltages and currents and do something with that. And then later you put it back through math and linear algebra and your uh, Jupyter notebooks into some other form of information. Similarly with touch screens, the information is where's my finger? And I need to figure out a transduction mechanism, how to move that, how to take that information and convert it into something that's a, uh, that a circuit can understand. It's a, it's a current, it's a voltage, right? So we will use resistors and capacitors for that. And again, we'll have some processing circuits because now a uh, little processor or do you know can understand these circuits uh, uh, parameters like voltages and currents similarly in positioning we're going to be generating some set of waveforms on a, on our uh, speakers some mathematical patterns signal patterns that will help us understand where are we in space sense that with a microphone again microphone converts the pressure into currents and voltages, and then again our circuits will be able to uh, sense that, and then math, math behind that will be able to work on it to figure out where you are in the, in the space. Right? So in all these three examples, the same exact kind of procedure. Sense, process, and then do something based on that. Hopefully you'll get uh, kind of better and better as we go through it. Okay. Um, We'll start with the first one, which is module one imaging, um, and you'll see how, how these things unfold. Thank you. Okay, so now time comes for the real fun part, class is starting. Just a fun fact that I remembered uh, while Vladimir was speaking, that Claude Shannon actually used to try to juggle while unicycling and videotape himself doing this. And uh, there was recently a documentary released about his, his life, and he's really an example of someone who like, played with the physical real world and used that to inspire the kind of problems he thought about. So 
some of the, his biggest like, innovations came from thinking about real, tangible, physical problems, not problems that are abstract and, and in software. So it's, it's an interesting, um, interesting thing to think about. If you ever get a chance to watch the documentary, I highly recommend it. But with that, we will start the imaging module. So has anyone seen this picture before? This is a painting from uh, 1632, I believe, Rembrandt. And it is a artist's depiction of people learning about anatomy. And what they're doing is to learn to see actually what is inside someone. Let's say someone was sick. Largely, medical practices in the past would require uh, a surgeon to actually cut the person open to like, look, let me see. Oh, is there like something growing there? Oh, is your bone broken? Because I can't see if I just look through my, if I just look at my arm. And what is it about us that doesn't allow, you know, you to just look at, look inside you and see, oh, is there something wrong with your liver or your stomach or your intestine? Yeah? Visible light doesn't penetrate. Our skin is opaque, right? So we cannot directly see through, um, through our skin. But then what do we mean when we talk about imaging? Today, if you were to go to a doctor and your doctor said, well, I don't really know what's wrong with you. Let's stick a knife in. <laughs> I don't know how many of you would still be with that doctor if that was the first thing that the person tried. This is not how we practice medicine anymore. And the reason we don't practice medicine like that is enabled by people who have been building engineering systems and engineering systems that have foundations in the material that you will be learning in this class. So what I'm showing here are different kinds of imaging modalities. Um, how many people have had either an MRI or an X-ray or a CT scan uh, taken in their life? Yeah. Most of us have already had one of these. And what these are doing is they're ways of actually taking measurements and imaging in a way um, what is happening exactly inside our body without having actually visible light or having our eyes being able to directly see uh, what is going inside. So the first lab module that we're going to be talking about is actually motivated by uh, tomography. How many people what know what tomography is or tomography means? How many people know what a, a CT scan, what, are the, what does the C and the T in a CT scan stand for? Yeah? Computed tomography. So all of these imaging modalities are actually a form of tomography. Tomo it means to slice and graphy means to write. So what this is doing, this technology is actually allowing us to penetrate um, even though visible light cannot. And for this, we use different kinds of energy sources. We use things like x-rays, MRIs are much more complicated. Um, you need to understand a lot more physics to be able to really follow that. But what we're going to try and do in the lab as well as through the lectures is give you a sense, give you a kind of very, very simplified perspective on how these technologies might work. And this is very much an example of how this class is designed and the aesthetic that we aspire to have as engineers. When there's something big and complicated and I don't know how to understand it, the first thing I always do is I try and say, can I make the problem simpler? What here is extraneous that I can drop? Keep simplifying the problem, simplifying the problem until I get to a problem that I can solve. Then I add one complexity. Can I still use the same technique? Add another complexity. This back and forth of going up and down the complexity stack is, again, important skill for computer scientist, engineer, anyone. And that's what we're going to try and teach you, and that's what we're going to try and do in this class. Um, OK, so let's start, actually. So here, this image, this, this is an MRI image. What do the pixels in this image actually represent? Your brain, when you, take a pic, when you look at it, if you were to slice it open, it doesn't look black and white, right? What these are showing is actually they're showing different properties of the different materials inside. 
So they might be measuring things like absorption or density. And what we're using is the fact that different kinds, uh, that when you pass an energy source into a material, it reacts differently. So for example, if you pass some kind of energy, different materials in your body, for example, the blood, the tissue, the muscle, the bone, might absorb that energy to different extents. And how tomography works is by measuring the absorption and actually then learning and, and taking multiple measurements to then be able to reconstruct what the actual internal properties were. So one of the things that we do in tomography is basically we take projections. So what happens when you, for, for people who've been maybe in a CT scan or have had this experience, what, or even just an x-ray, what happens? An x-ray is shined on you and then there's a measurement taken on the other side. And usually multiple measurements are taken. And then what happens is that these measurements are combined to reconstruct something to give you the actual image. So there's part of the imaging system that is actually computational, and there, there's part of the, energies, uh, of the imaging system that is an energy source. Um, so, let me... so what I want to talk about today is actually just give you a very simple example for how um, tomography might work. We're not going to be able to fully talk about how an MRI actually works. If you're actually interested in this, there is a class, 225A, uh, which is taught by Mickey Lustig. Uh, and the class is exclusively about understanding how MRI works. So once you take 16A and 16B, and then maybe 120, and then probably maybe you might have to take like 220 something, but then 225 should be, 225 should be accessible to you. And you can actually design an MRI. But what we're doing right now is we're going to talk about a baby example. And I'm going to actually talk to you about um, an MRI the way someone first explained tomography to me. So here, I want to understand how this, pic how this picture was actually generated. But I'm going to apply the aesthetic that we just talked about. There's many, many pixels here. And I can't fully understand this complicated picture. So let me try and take a coarser picture. Let me look at something with fewer pixels. And can I then take measurements to try and understand something about these fewer pixels? This is still a lot of pixels. What if I try and simplify this even further? What if we simplify it down to just having four pixels in our problem? So to understand this, what I want to do is I want to think about, you know, Tomography is actually used to image parts of the human body, but let's think about a really, really simple case. And for this, I'm going to switch to this document camera. Okay. Can you read this? Is this large enough for people to see? Okay, great. So let's say you are working at a grocery store. And what you have is a very large crate. And this crate is actually full of different kinds of bottles. Let's say they're bottles with different kinds of juice in them. And I have a really large stack of these things, so I can't actually see. Let's say I wanted to figure out what is exactly in this layer. I unfortunately, there's a huge stack of these things. I can't really take them apart and go inside and see what is going on in there? What are the juice bottles that are exactly in that, in that slot? Just like, you know, you can't really like take off this side of me to see what's happening on the right side of my brain. I would be pretty upset if you somehow decided to take away the left half of my brain to look at the right side. Yeah, question? It's not focused. How to focus this? Okay. 
Ah, okay. Thank you. More signal processing algorithms. If you design the homework problem on how Zoom buttons work, I will give you extra credit. So now let's say we're looking at, at this box. And we're looking at something which has just, you know, there's four bottles in every layer. So now we're looking at this x1, x2, x3, x4. And what x1, x2, x3, and x4 represent is that they represent the amount of light that will be absorbed if I shine a unit beam of light through this bottle. So I have a juice bottle. I shine some light through this side. I measure it on the other side. Some of the light has been absorbed by the juice bottle. What is the light that I measure out on the other side? We're making a simple caricature problem to try and understand how tomography works. So, th there's, there's a, so basically, so let's say we shine some light through here. And let's say in our model, if this bottle absorbs x1, and this bottle absorbs x2. Then here, we absorb a total of x1 plus x2, which let's say is b1. So let's say we measure b1 here. And let's say our model for the system allows us to see that x1 plus x2 equals b1. Because we don't know x1. We don't know how much absorb how much the first bottle absorbs. We don't know how much the second bottle absorbs. But we can measure out at the other end that a total of B1 was absorbed. Everyone okay with this? We're making a model for a system that we're trying to understand. What if then we measure light, we, we shine light again at the second layer, through the second row of bottles? And out we measure B2. OK, so what equation should I write down? Call it out. x3 plus x4 equals b2. OK, what would you do next? Shine from the top. I see all these hand motions, right? OK, let's shine from the top. So let's say I got out b3. So I got x1 plus x3 equal to b3. And then shining from the top, is that the consensus? So then we shine from here, we get out, let's say we get out b4. So x2 plus x4 equal to b4. OK, so remember, every x represents a kind of juice which has a certain amount of absorption. The b1, b2, b3, b4, we can all measure. We want to figure out what x1, x2, x3, x4 are. Hopefully, we can do this. Why don't you guys all take a minute, make a small group of people, discuss the idea. See how you can actually solve this problem. Look to your left, look to your right. Make sure there's no one actually left alone. If you see someone around you who doesn't have a partner to talk to, bring them into your group. Include people. OK, how many people know how to solve the problem from here on out? OK, how many people are like, eh, something's fishy? Eh. OK, so how many unknowns do we have here? How many equations do we have here? Four. 
What would we hope to have? Four equations and four unknowns to be able to solve things. But is there a problem with these equations? Maybe, maybe not. So what happens if I do the following? Let's say I take, let's call these equations 1, equation 2, equation 3, and equation 4. What is 1 plus 2 equal to? It equals b1 plus b2, but it's x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4. And what is equation 3 plus equation 4 equal to? x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4. So what do we have here? We have, do we have four equations that are independent of each other? These equations depend on each other, right? So it's basically like I shone light through the same layer twice and copied the equation. And I'm like, well, you know, I have x1 equals 1. If I write it out 10 times, maybe I get 10 equations. Doesn't quite work like that, right? That's what's happening here. So we can't actually use these to solve the system. So what can we do? This is exactly where you put your engineering hat on. You are designing the scan. You are designing the tomography machine. What do you do? Someone at the back. I haven't had anyone from this part of the class speak yet. Yeah. Diagonals. What happens if we try a diagonal? So let's measure from here. Let's shine light from here. And we get out, let's say, B5. So this gives me x1 plus x4. equal to b5. OK. Now, let's say I tell you the following. I tell you that b1 equal to 2, b2 equal to 5, b3 equal to 3, and b4 equal to 4. Uh, sorry, I wanted to say b5 equal to 4. I apologize. OK, take a minute, talk to your neighbors, see if you can actually solve the system now. Tell me what x1, x2, x3, x4 are. Again, don't leave people out. Include people next to you. If someone doesn't have a partner, be friendly. Learning to talk about your ideas is part of this course. OK. How many people know what x1, x2, x3, and x4 are? OK, can we hear a chorus? What is x1? One. x2? One. x3? Two. And x4? Three. Great. How many of you think that, you know, let's say there's a couple of people around. Everyone here solved the problem. Everyone here solved the problem. Everyone here solved the problem. How many people think that there's someone else in the room that did it exactly the same way they did the problem? Maybe. How many people think there's at least 10 people who did the problem slightly differently from the way they did the problem? Right? How did you solve the problem? You solved the problem by you know, doing some substitutions. It's a small problem. There's four equations. There's four unknowns. This is something that is very manageable. Now imagine you're actually designing a CT scanner. Do you think you're going to have four variables? Probably not. How many equations do you want to solve out by hand? Probably not more than four. 
There's a reason I chose this example. I definitely don't want to solve more than four. Actually, how many people have watched the movie Hidden Figures? This is one of my all-time favorite movies. I highly recommend it. But if you remember from watching this movie or from reading the book, there was a time when we did not have computers, when we actually had to do these calculations by hand, because there was no way of actually using technology to um, speed up our computational processes. And so there would be actually groups of people, and in fact, largely women, who would do computations that led to some of the biggest scientific innovations um, in the past uh, century. And what we are trying to do now is we're saying, look, you know, we could possibly maybe solve a 50 by 50 or 100 by 100 system of equations by hand, but do we want to? No, no. this is why we're engineers. What this, why do we need to learn a subject like linear algebra? The idea of linear algebra is to help you learn how to do what you just did by hand, but do it using a computer. How can you automate this process? How can you automatically detect that, hey, something is off. I have technically four equations and four unknowns, but really some of them are the same equations. You know, you can't always play around with your equations. What if you have hundreds of equations? Can you always detect this? We need to design algorithms. We need to design procedures. We need to have ways of detec detecting this automatically. And this is what this class is going to try and teach you, to be able to do this computationally and efficiently. Um, with that, I think I have a few more minutes. So let me switch back. So while we're going to be talking about linear algebra in class and trying to learn automated algorithms and techniques by which we can actually solve systems of linear equations very, very quickly using computational tools, the, the module in general is going to be designed around imaging. And the lab in particular will be talking about how you can image a particular object using an energy source and then measuring either reflected or absorbed energy from the system. The example we talked about right now is talking about absorbed energy. In the lab, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be measuring reflected light from the image. I'll actually skip this and talk here. So one of the ways that we're going to actually be dealing with this, this lab is we're going to say, what if we cannot just take an entire picture of the whole system at one time? Just in the same way in a CT scan, you don't just take one picture. It's not like instantaneously you get all of the measurements and the picture is formed. How is this happening? This is happening because you take a series of measurements in sequence, one by one, that you then computationally combine to actually reconstruct your image. The lab is actually exactly going to parallel this. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be building a single pixel camera. What this means is that, let's say you want to actually take this image, but you have only one detector. You can only measure, you can only take one measurement exactly at a time. Then you have two options. You can either look at a very, very small part of the image at one time, and then measure little part by little part, or you can do something more clever, which is you can actually take multiple measurements and then computationally combine them. And that's exactly what you're going to be doing in the lab. So now, what you will be doing is you will be using patterned illumination. You will basically be having a projector that will allow you to project a pattern of pixels onto the image. So you will be shining light onto this image. And you will be measuring the sum of the reflected light from that image. And if you do this with multiple different measurements, you will be able to actually reconstruct the image. One way, of course, you could do this is you could say, well, I want to measure this little pixel. I will shine the piece of light exactly here. That's one way you could do it. Um, but the way, actually, that ends up being much more efficient is that you will actually have 
pattern. So you'll measure linear combinations of different pixels and combine them to then be able to reconstruct your image. I don't have enough time to go into all of the details that I want to go into. But basically, this is going to be the setup for your imaging lab that you will be able to talk about more in uh, your lab sections. This is what it will look like. And I think that is it. We'll pick up here next time. I have office hours right after. If anyone has questions, please come talk to me.